Paul, the, the book that you and I collaborated on over 30 years ago focused on the impact of outward FDI on the US as the home country of the motor nationals. And you've got a chapter on that in the new book, but you didn't really say too much about it in your oral remarks, except for the comments about OPIC. Um, why don't you bring us, bring the audience up to date on that part of the argument? How you see outward FDI, particularly to developing and emerging markets, as affecting the US economy, particularly given the fact the current administration has wanted to tighten taxation on outward FDI, has generally had pretty uh, critical rhetoric about the impact of outward FDI on the US economy. Are they right? or are the views that you and I came to a long time ago uh, still to be believed? Well, when you leave it that way, of course, Fred, the views we came to 30 <laughs> years ago are still perfectly correct. I, I, uh, I wouldn't deviate from that. But uh, this is a serious question. Um, how do you find out the answer? The way you find out the answer is you look at firms that engage in outward investment to developing countries and firms that don't so much or don't at all. And you have to have the same size firms, the same high tech, low tech firms. In other words, you control for all kinds of differences that might account for whether they invest uh, uh, abroad. And then you look at their competitiveness at home as measured by their exportability. And the reason why I'm going through this methodology is because what you find is that American multinationals that invest in developing countries actually export more. So there isn't, it isn't an either or. They actually export more than their counterparts who don't invest abroad. And they maintain a higher skilled level workforce at home. And they actually are less subject to bankruptcy, which means that they're actually more stable employers in their communities. So out, engaging in outward investment not only you know, uh, increases the export base, but it actually enhances the base at home. And this, this uh, well, this shows, first of all, that it's, that it's a win-win phenomenon when they engage in outward investment. And it also shows you the counterfactual. The counterfactual is what if they didn't invest abroad? Well, then they would behave like other firms with exactly the same characteristics who didn't. And you'd have fewer exports, more bankruptcies, and worse off workers and communities. So, I mean, it, it, it isn't a question of, well, I think this, or I kind of am in favor of globalization or something. I mean, you can measure this precisely and see that, uh, that you're better off. I'm not the uh, tax expert, and we have the world's leading tax expert sitting next to the world's second most uh, prominent uh, aid expert. So we can turn in the tax direction if we want to, but I, I, I think I'll leave uh, that debate. I'm not an expert on that. Just so everybody knows, <laughs> Ted was referring to Gary Huffbauer and his wife. <laughs> <laughs> I presume in the inverse order of importance, but uh, in any of that. Uh, Lars, um, just add a word from the European perspective uh, on this argument that we have in this country, as Ted's just described it, that FDI by your domestic firms, exports jobs, hollows out, hurts the domestic economy. Uh, what's been the attitude in Sweden, but more broadly Europe, uh, on that set of topics? Well, you, al you always, of course, have the, what I would call the populistic type of arguments that it's, it's dangerous with <coughs> foreign direct investments. But I think for Sweden and the Swedish, big Swedish multinationals like Electrolux and, and others, who are so, have 90% of their operations outside of the, um, have a, outside of Sweden. Obviously for them, everybody realizes that, that uh, export is driving. And I think what 
some of these companies <coughs> have been able to do is get the argument across that they, if we focus on the, what we call the, the noble parts, and, and uh, then you can let others assembly and you can let others do the, the simpler, less value-added things. Focus on, on the, the engineered parts. Uh, focus on, on the things uh, that takes uh, higher education to actually get to. That, uh, that people have seen the benefits of that. And I think that's, the, that's why Sweden is growing about 7% now. Ted, uh, let me shift to the impact on the host countries, which you focused yes. on primarily and ask you two related questions about the manufacturing component of it, which, as Lars said, is the most uh, controversial part. Um, you said in the study, and we repeated that in the press release, that uh, there's a very high ratio of FDI in higher to lower skill uh, intensive industries and sectors, and you criticize that, and you call on the firms to uh, try to reverse that, at least to some extent, by upgrading and diversifying their production and export base. Uh, why don't you explain that? I mean, superficially, one might say, well, they do more in the higher skills, that upgrades the local industries. Well, what's wrong with that? Why do you want to shift it more to lower skill uh, industries, if I read you right? Uh, and a related question, you called on the companies and the countries to diversify their export mix but arguably the world's most successful exporting country hasn't changed its mix at all for 50 years. That's Germany. So was it necessary to diversify or just to do things well? Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't quite understand your first point about me, because I, 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 I don't think I make an argument that, that they should have lower, that multinationals should engage in more lower skilled operations. But anyway, let, uh, well, let, me, let me read you from the press release which you wrote, <laughs> which I approved this morning. It says, the, this waiting toward more skill intensive, because I didn't understand it at the time, so now I'm really nailing you with it. <laughs> this, this waiting toward more skill intensive FDI activities is accelerating significantly. The ratio of FDI at higher to lower skill intensive uh, was roughly five to one in the past, 14 to one more lately. To reverse this trend, Moran suggests that multinationals use FDI to upgrade and diversify their production and export base. Uh-oh. We screwed up the press release. <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I don't want to reverse I know it's the use through. of we, but that's all, but that's all right. I approved it. <laughs> well, <clears throat> all right. The, um, it, now, the argument was, uh, was what you heard, that it, it, there is a huge preoccupation, and rightly so, with sweatshop-type activities. And indeed, there's a whole chapter in the book on, uh, on combating sweatshop abuses. So this is in no way to downplay that. Uh, but then I point out that you have 14 times as much middle skill manufacturing and as you, as we got right in the press release, you know, 10 years ago it was 5 to 1, now it's 14 to 1. So it, you, it, it, you're really offering more and more access to middle skilled type activities. Now, uh, the, the, well, the statistics, the what you export matters literature, which, uh, I mean, it includes Hausman and Roderick and lots of uh, other people who are all cited there, show that if you have a more diversified mix and a higher skilled mix of exports, unless, so Germany must be an outlier, um, you have higher domestic welfare, higher growth rates. I mean, I haven't done that research, but I mean, that's pretty widely accepted. But let me give you a concrete example, because we at PIIE are doing a lot of work now with Morocco. Morocco has uh, a, a large um, textile, footwear, garment industry that's largely based on foreign direct investment. They are trying to build Tangiers into a kind of a 
Penang. I mean, a high. I mean, they're right across the Straits of Gibraltar. They're on the they're on the fringes of the EU. They want to have electronics and auto parts and you know much more sophisticated operations there. But to do that, and they're having a lot of trouble. To do that, I, I, Lars, I don't know if you're, you probably have a lot of expertise in Morocco, but they have to do a combination of upgrading the port, upgrading the industrial facilities around the par port, upgrading the supplier possibilities uh, around, and, um, and then, then they have to change. As you pointed out in your remarks, their education system in Morocco, it isn't as bad as Egypt, but I mean, it, it really is not a very practically oriented education system. So they've got to change that. And then the most controversial thing uh, is they have to redo their labor legislation. What is Moroccan, I, I, well, maybe we do have Moroccans here. I mean, I will say it straight. The Moroccan labor legislation is like 1970s France tightened. I mean, to say they, you, you, there's no distinction between laying a worker off and firing a worker. You have huge severance payments. The severance payments are then challenged in court. You have to pay the worker while the court proceedings go on. I mean, it is just a mess. And so, you know, do, do auto people and electronics people, even if they've got a nice port and relatively inexpensive labor, but do they want to go into Tangiers and, you know, use that as an export hub? Well, they have to do all of these reforms together. But if you had Penang, the Malaysian uh, economic powerhouse, there in Tangiers, you'd have 750,000 workers earning middle class salaries and exporting $70 billion a year, that's Penang's exports, into the EU. And uh, so, you know, what's not to like about that as a 20 year objective to kind of build that kind of an industrial hub uh, in, uh, in Morocco? I'm sorry, I've gone on a long time, but I have that example on my mind. Lars, anything you want to add on that set of topics? No, I, I think it comes to the, the point that you need to look at the whole system. And, and uh, the infrastructure, as I said in my remarks, are very important. I mean, there are studies shown that you can reach kind of Chinese level of productivity within a factory in Africa. But to get it out there cost a fortune. And I think this is what it's all about. You need to have the people, you need the systems, you need the, the, uh, the infrastructure. Before we open it to the audience, though I'll kind of do that in a way, um, let's turn just for a moment to the extractive sector. And since we've got Russell King from Freeport here, uh, ask him to uh, maybe elaborate a bit on the comment he made directly to Ted's remark about the extractive industries, uh, transparency, and his argument, which you obviously endorse, but I'd like you to elaborate on uh, why you as a company and the industry more broadly sees that in their interest, and do you think that's going to significantly improve the climate for FDI in your sector and uh, stabilize both corporate returns and economic impact over time? No, thanks, Brad. Uh, I guess I've learned, again, that there's no free lunch in Washington, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for the opportunity. Uh, a, a couple of uh, comments in the broad sweep of that question. Uh, I noted in, in uh, Ted's presentation, he talked about resource curse. I would ask that in future presentations, he put a slash and after that say blessing, because we uh, uh, hope we're on the blessing side of that issue. Uh, as far as our uh, transparency, we are in EITI, we sit on the, one of our a senior people sits on the board of EITI. Uh, we've been with it uh, from very, very early on. Our uh, corporate view, uh, publicly and privately stated, uh, is that transparency is in our enlightened self-interest. Uh, the, the, when we're in a, a, a country, when you're in the resource business and the mining business and you make an investment, you're not making a quick in and out investment. You're making a strategic investment of billions and you're looking over the horizon. And you have to act that way. Uh, you have to uh, uh, share benefits and, and so that there is a, 
a, a, a large community, and a lot of this Ted pointed out, and Lars did in his comments about, uh, the, in essence, the shared prosperity. But the transparency of what we pay the government is important. If it's not transparent, uh, it may or may not ever get there. Uh, it, there can be leakage, or in some in instances, vaporization. And uh, so it's in our interest for it to be transparent, uh, and we have supported that through EITI. Uh, when Congress was working on this legislation, we were very interactive with Congress. Uh, I will say that in the presentation, uh, a lot more emphasis, I would say, needs to be on those countries that are investing that aren't subject to the SEC. Uh, if we were reluctant in this, and we're not, we're low-hanging fruit. To, to, you can come beat up the U.S. companies over and over and over again, but you've got to keep the mindset about getting the other players in the game and how you get them. I'll just close out with one anecdote, which is my favorite on this subject. A, a, a group of parliamentarians from a country that we have a very large investment was here a, a decade ago, and, and I went to listen to them much like this. I got an opportunity to speak because they realized I was there, and they pulled me to the front and we're criticizing our investment <coughs> and the split of it. And I walked them through the taxes, the shared ownership, I walked, uh, you know, in the broad sense. And they looked at me and said, we, I don't believe you. And, and of course, I tell people that's the second best answer I could have gotten because the implication was, and it was true what I said, if that was true, it would be fair, which was the point. But anyway, thank you for giving me the chance to make a little comment, and I hope it, it, it helped. No, thank you. So I can't resist circling back to Ted and asking him one follow-up question to that. Uh, when we did that book 30 years ago, and I always gave you credit for this, uh, we incorporated the notion, I think it was new at the time, of what we called the obsolescing bargain, that a company like Freeport would sink a huge amount of capital, put a big hole in the ground, start digging stuff out, and at that point, the host country government really had you because you'd sunk the capital, but the mining could then go on, and so your deal, however legally ironclad you thought, tended to obsolesce quickly. Um, question, does that principle still obtain and or do steps like the transparency initiative, the kind of things that Russell was talking about, have those helped a lot to reduce the risk thereof? Um, the potential for the obsolescent bargain, which is to tighten a contract when, after you've hooked the investor and gotten him there, is still very real as witnessed by the following. We had a, uh, a conference co-sponsored with MEGA at uh, Georgetown that OPIC was at, that uh, uh, you know, Lloyds of London, Chubb, uh, AIG, which has a new name, I mean, the AIG, uh, political risk insurance people who have a new name, we're all at. And contract frustration and uh, breach of contract insurance is still the rap most rapidly growing. So, I mean, they're, they're, worried about, uh, they're worried about that. I don't know exactly about the correlation, but I have to say there is more uh, positive stuff going on in the extractive industry's resource opportunity now than I think there ever has been before because the money is so big. So I, I, I am sure what you say is absolutely true. Let me take another example, Antamina in Peru, which I don't think you're involved in, in Antamina. But they are required by law to give such large amounts of money to the mining communities, simply because the copper and gold prices are so high now, that they have brought in uh, Global Witness, Transparency International, uh, Publish What You Pay, the other, to form Peruvian NGOs, branches of Global Witness, train them, Put them in the local community because otherwise, you know, the you you don't know what's going to happen to the money. I mean, to say they want the money spent on the community, they've got to give it to somebody. They don't want it to go to for football stadiums and you know uh, stuff in the pocket of the mayor. They they want schools and other things so that they are actually 
building up the NGO infrastructure around their mines and in their mining communities so that, so that everybody can see what's going on. Um, so I, I think that's an extension of what you were saying, and I have seen it in, in, in place in Peru. I'm sure you have many other examples of the same thing. Okay, floor is open, questions and comments. Uh, Steve, uh, please identify yourself and then fire away. Hi, I'm Stephen Canner with the U.S. Council for International Business. Uh, Ted, you may have just answered my question, but on EITI and transparency on the money going in, that's one side of the equations, one half of the accounting sheet. What do you do on the other side? What are the obligations of the receiving countries, the state-owned enterprises, the ministers, who take this money and disperse it? How do you hold them accountable? and transparent that the money indeed will go into mining the copper or the zinc or the lead or what have you. Yeah, yeah, Steve, I, I mean the excellent, it, it has got to be a two-part equation and uh, if you look at EITI compliant countries, they are supposed to then publish what they spend it on I mean, you're supposed, the, the, the way the publish what you pay system works is the companies, hopefully individually, one by one. So you can see uh, what the mining companies and the oil companies paid in. And then the treasury or the revenue service is supposed to publish what they paid. And I know the World Bank has done a lot of this simply also show what they disperse to the provinces, because frequently the provinces say, we never saw $13 million come here. I mean, where is it? You say you did it. So, I mean, it's, it, the whole system has to be much more transparent, and then it's very nitty-gritty business. I have to say, I've now been involved in the practicality of this. The people have to be trained. I mean, to say you have to have some uh, some competence in looking at payment streams, matching them, having them in a form that legislators in, let's take an example, Ghana. This is, is, Ghana is just becoming for the first time in history an oil producer this year. Is this going to be a curse or is it going to be a blessing? And nobody knows the answer to that. This is going to be the biggest thing that's ever happened to Ghana because they're going to be a major oil producer. Well, Soros and uh, Lissakers and you know, lots of other people are working hard to try and develop the institutions in Ghana so that this, and Ghana is becoming an EITI member. I mean, they're, they've just applied. They, they're, they, they, they've got to get this system set up. You've got to get NGOs set up. You have to have legislators trained. I mean, it's a big process to figure out how Ghana can not become like Nigeria. Ghana can become like, um, well, Chile with copper. Chile doesn't have oil, but I mean, you know, it's pretty transparent. There are people who know what's going on. You have financial fir accounting firms coming in and doing double checks, et cetera. Well, Ghana's got to get that right, or they're going to be another Nigeria. Howard. <clears throat> Ted, you, you've said a lot of interesting things, and I've been sitting here debating because I've got two questions I want to ask you, so I'm sorry I'm going to have to ask you both of them. So the first is that on, on this issue of employment laws, um, it's, it's my experience doing some AID work in some of these countries that there's de jure and de facto employment laws. Um, the ones on the books and the ones that the, M, the multinationals cut a deal in order to bring in the investment. So. Uh, I think, I have also been in Penang, I'm almost sure that that is an, inv that is an investment free zone, I mean a, a, a tax free zone or whatever they call it, enterprise zone, and those gigantic plants there do not come under the employment laws of Malaysia. Um, so the question, that question is, uh, to what extent, and, and you, you raised in your presentation that the non, the nonprofits, the NGOs, should try to broaden out their agendas to, you know, so to what extent do the MNCs broaden out and try to go beyond their own specific needs? So for example, instead of cutting a deal with a country, come in and say to a country, come on, let's sit down and let's work out your employment laws for everyone, not just for me. 
So that's the first question, I'm sorry. The second one is your discussion with Fred on exports because this is really critical. I think, I think I am familiar with the data that you are talking about. So the question that I have is, um, do we know if the nature of the exports have changed over the last 30 years? I, U.S. exports? Yeah, because so your point about investment not displacing in expo exports. So I, I, would, I would hypothesize that 30 years ago, we were, when we were exporting finished goods, we were sending out you know, FDI for textiles and things like that. But we know that the characteristic of U.S. exports have changed. So it's very possible that we are now exporting inputs and other countries are doing the assembly. In that sense, we may not be displacing exports per se, but it is changing in terms of the nature of the exports, the kinds of jobs that are involved, the, vo the value of those exports. So to just say exports are still rising by U.S. companies that are doing FD FDI doesn't really answer the question about the displacement because there may be changes in the nature of those kinds of exports. And I think, if I'm familiar with the data that you were quoting, those data don't tell us that. They only give us a total export number. Okay, two excellent questions. Um, first of all, on export processing zones and industrial zones and labor regulation, uh, it, you will find some interesting new data in here. And uh, the, the, if you look at um, foreign direct investment in export processing zones in low-skilled activities, so you're still looking primarily at garments and footwear and toys and stuff like that. That's where the labor abuses are clustered. And you may be able to get a handle on that with high profile Nike or Fila or you know some, but it, 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 that is tough. I mean, we have to look each other in the eye and, and wonder how many labor, labor abuses there are in El Salvador or in the Philippines or et cetera. The new information is that as you move up the uh, skill level, the treatment of workers as well as the wages, so when you get into electronics and auto parts and Intel and uh, you know, medical devices, um, you find, I mean, survey data show that yes, there are canteens, yes, there are clinics, Yes, there are safe transport. Uh, yes, there are air conditioning. Yes, there is, you know, and the wages, are, you know, three or four or five hundred percent of, 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 the, of the minimum wage. Um, so, and many of them are unionized. Uh, I don't know exactly what the labor reg regulation in Penang is. Uh, there may be other people here who, who know Penang better than I do, but, but once you get into the higher processing um, cent industrial centers and industrial parks, you, you know, you, it's a different ball game with regard to labor regulation and labor treatment. Sorry, Ted, I just want to clarify. I'm not suggesting that they're substandard. What I'm suggesting is that they cut separate deals and therefore, so in Penang, you're right, they've got great standards, but because they cut a special deal, they did nothing for the people who don't work in Penang. So Malaysia still uh, has uh, terrible uh, labor policies yeah. because the MNC went in there and just did their own deal. So instead of doing your own deal and go into the country and say, we want to help you change for everybody, uh, it sounds good to me. I mean, so you're saying Intel should be in favor of kind of upgrading Malaysian labor regulations in general. It's your point of I vote for that. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how you're going to get that to work, but, but I'm, I, I, I agree with that. Now, uh, with regard to exports, you are right in the statistical comparison, they don't tell you what kind of exports. So I, I know, because I've looked at some case studies, if you look at Motorola, Seagate, uh, you know, some others, it's more and more management services and export of engineering services, et cetera. So that they, uh, th what's counted as exports is really the whole package to put together the disk drives, and it's in 
Penang or China or the Philippines that the actual uh, disk drive is, is getting, assemb getting assembled. But, you know, do, do you want your kids to work for Seagate? Wouldn't be bad. I mean to say they'd have to they'd have to be an they'd have to be an engineer or an IT specialist or a management or a f finance person, uh, you know they're not going to be a uh, a factory worker, but um, put that on your list. I'm focusing on my daughter Seagate for you. <laughs> okay, Lars. Well, just a couple of comments. First of all, I think what we see now among big companies is that they or even local companies that are creating their own standards. We're working, for example, with child labor and cotton, with what's something called the Better Cotton Initiative, where H&M, The Gaps, and all those firms are trying to establish their own standards. We see that in soya, we see it in Bangladesh, in textiles. <coughs> <laughs> so that's one. The, the other thing is, in our doing business report, this question of, of what is the kind of the appropriate level of, of or effective labor standards uh, is, the most, uh, say, discussed issue and indicator, and, and you see various government taking very strong positions on that issue, so it's a, it's a very, very tough issue. On the trade issue, I think Pascal Lamy, uh, the head of the World Trade Organization, I think six months ago or so, had an op-ed where he actually made the exactly that argument and said we should really start to look at value-added uh, exports and look at it on, on that sense in the statistics instead of the gross number and he took the U.S. Chinese trade as an example of saying, if you really start to look at it, a lot of what comes out of China has actually been imported as very high value added from the United States and other industrialized countries. Okay, uh, question up here and then back to Mike. Well, with Layman Ways and Means Committee, um, you, uh, you argue that uh, extractive industries, infrastructure, manufacturing and services are sufficiently distinct that they should be treated separately in our analysis, not just methodological, you, say, you note. Um, and my question is, I imagine that there are a good number of things that make these different, but my question is what, how important in particular uh, one uh, factor is in setting these off from each other, and that is the presence of governments. Uh, in, for example, extractive industries on the contractor side, uh, or on the con, yeah, on uh, contracting with the foreign investor, and then also sovereign wealth as an investor. Um, do, is this a particularly important thing in setting off these different types of investment? And in particular, is the presence of sovereign wealth as an investor and governments? contracting with investors, uh, um, something that undermines the benefit of investment? Hmm, that, that is a very interesting question. You do find, in particular in extractive industries, but to a certain extent more and more in infrastructure, if you mean power projects or water projects, sewer projects, uh, governments coming back in, you know, so you have national oil companies and and then the phenomenon of international government owned, I mean the Sinopec, Sinook type, uh, um, and that brings lots of tricky questions. It's not like the 70s where you just said, well, government participation means it's a terrible operation and low productivity because you have some of these government owned or government partially owned uh, companies that are pretty effective and seem to be operating pretty professionally. So it certainly is a factor. Sovereign wealth, I tend to see sovereign wealth having potential for development. I, I really would like to turn it to Lars because it sounds like you have been raising and kind of intermediating money from sovereign wealth funds. Uh, so I'd like to see that as a positive step forward, figuring out how to get sovereign wealth funds more invested in developing countries, but I'm not really an expert on that. Well, what, what we have done is that we established a separate uh, subsidiary, I guess we're the first development institution with a subsidiary, <laughs> with the actual motive of, of mobilizing sovereign wealth fund money. And we set up the first fund, which is for a billion dollars, 
investing in Africa and Latin America, co-investing with us. In other words, they take 25% of our equity investments, and they do it uh, on a commercial basis. We control the investments, and, and um, I think that's a way of channeling money and getting them to understand some of the challenges in, in the emerging markets, and hopefully then they can go on and, and invest by themselves uh, in, in these countries. So I, I would look at that as positive. Of course, then you've got other situations where, where um, and you see this in some of the big state-owned Chinese companies maybe that, that have kind of a political mandate also, and, and then you start getting into tricky. If you take a, a good example, I think I was, on the fir I was the first non-Norwegian on the, on the board of Statoil, and <clears throat> that to me is, is a company that is run on commercial principles, not separated from it happens to be partly owned by the government of Norway, but it's really run as any other company. And I see no danger with, with that. So I think you have to look at the actual governance of the institution. That to me is the key. Mike Musa? Yes, I was a little concerned in the colloquy with uh, Howard uh, that uh, we were committing economic heresy uh, on uh, two uh, related issues. Um, in international trade theory, we learn that productive efficiency is gained for a national economy by contracting those industries in which we lack comparative advantage and expanding those industries in which we possess it. So uh, achieving the gains from international trade inevitably is associated with job destruction. Uh, it's a question of getting the most efficient combination of jobs, and that means letting some go. And I would think with respect to direct foreign investment, a similar principle must apply, that uh, firms may invest abroad and produce abroad what they, what they might otherwise have produced with investment in the United States because they can do so more efficiently and cheaply. Those jobs are lost, but it doesn't tell us anything about what happens to aggregate employment or aggregate wages. So any kind, type of rule which says, thou must not ever destroy any job is a stupidity of the first magnitude. Uh, and I think we need to be uh, very careful uh, Are you running about for office, Mike? Is that going to be your... Uh, no, no, I, 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 as I said, I think you and Howard were creating economic heresy by subscribing to a principle that the economics profession has for centuries debunked. I, 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 you are right. And good luck in your campaign. Uh, in, in, no, I, 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 I endorse that. And let me give you actually an example that illustrates this, but from the point of view of a developing country, not, not just from whether a single job is lost in the United States. Uh, there has been, a, some of you may have seen, a very good analysis of the impact of Walmart on the Mexican economy. And the reason why I introduce this is because it gets into the crowding in, crowding out debate. And what Walmart did was crowded out a lot of the very inefficient, small, subscale Mexican uh, retailers. At the same time, it forced the consolidation of the more efficient and it brought in Carrefour and um, uh, uh, who's Costco and, uh, and some others. And it revolutionized the Mexican supplier system that you actually had to show up on time, that you had to uh, package your inputs in a particular way, that you had to deliver them on pallets that, I mean, the, the entire, and at the end of the day, you now have a quite efficient functioning, not all foreign owned, much of it is still Mexican owned, retail sector, and then the, in a typical study, you, they calculated the welfare gains as well as the you know, job and other things. And th there may be other reasons why people in the room don't care so much for Walmart, but this really was, over 10 years, has been a transformative experience that is very Schumpetrian, which I think is your point, that Walmart initially going in forced a total consolidation 
uh, of the Mexican real retail sector, and the result is right now that Mexican consumers and Mexican retailers are all better off. So uh, Mike, let me also just defend Ted in one other respect. You remember in his initial comments, uh, he, I say this with our OPIC friends here, he took OPIC to task for having as one of its rules that it shall not support any investments that destroy a single American job. Well, he rightly criticized that. He and I have done so in some of our earlier work on OPIC. Instead, go to a net job creation test, which would be very much along the lines that you suggest. Well, but we all spend lots of time trying to estimate where those are. Maybe, maybe a fool's game, but we do, and we try to show that. But anyway, the point being, net effects, not gross effects. Absolutely right. Okay, Bob Hertzstein, this will be the last question. Ted, did you, have you addressed the question of inward restrictions on foreign investment, such as local ownership requirements, technology transfer, et cetera, or do you not consider that relevant to the development issues that you're looking at? What a wonderful last question, Bob. Yes, I do address that, and it remains enormously uh, important, not least of all in China, but uh, still across Latin America and many other countries. Domestic content requirement, uh, joint mandatory joint venture requirements. Countries are governed to a certain extent by uh, the TRIMS agreement, but there are a lot of ways of getting around that. And it, as you allude to, the evidence shows that that almost always is a bad idea from a development perspective. Okay, Ted, many thanks for once again giving us some rich new thoughts on FDI. Lars, thank you in particular for sharing your experiences with us. Thanks to the audience for being here. Meeting adjourned.